Hello friends. Welcome to Workplace Hazards 1. The fourth sub-module under safety in the course Health, Safety, Environment Protection or HSE. HSE consists of four main modules that will cover the above-mentioned aspects in detail. Click here to view the learning outcomes for Workplace Hazards. Learning Outcomes after going through this module, you will be able to Describe various techniques that are used to identify hazards in the workplace and be able to select the correct hazard identification tool depending on the situation. Demonstrate an understanding about the hierarchy of control measures to be followed while developing the control measures for the following hazards, namely electricity, fire, machinery, manual and mechanical handling, transportation of men and materials, construction and demolition, etc. In the second element of this safety module, you discussed the five steps of risk assessment, namely, identification of hazards, elimination of as many hazards as possible, Assessment of risk from the residual hazards. Implementation of measures to reduce to a minimum any likely ill effects from the residual hazards. Monitoring the effectiveness of the precautionary measures. You are going to explore the first step of hazard identification in a more detailed manner before you move on to the specific hazards and controls at a later stage of this element. There are many reasons for the seriousness of a hazard to be not obvious to the person exposed to it. It may be that the hazard is not visible, radiation, certain gases and biological agents or have no short-term effect such as work-related upper limb disorders. The common reasons for the hazard to be not obvious or not visible include Lack of attention Lack of experience the wearing of personal protective equipment, sensory impairment, inadequate information, instruction and training. Let's explore first what is meant by hazard. A hazard is something with the potential to cause harm. This definition has two elements. The first is that a hazard has the ability to harm a person. The second is that the existence of a hazard does not mean that harm will arise. A hazard only has to have the potential to harm. In order for the hazard to result in harm, a hazardous event should take place. Identifying hazards is an ongoing process. There are everyday hazards associated with living. For example, using gas as a fuel to cook food. There are unusual hazards that most people encounter only rarely. For example, undergoing surgery. Here's more on hazards. There are hazards that will cause immediate harm if they are encountered. These are termed acute hazards and are usually recognizable to most people, so there is rarely a need for them to be explained. For example, most people will understand that being struck by a moving vehicle will result in immediate harm. Other hazards may affect us, but we do not experience immediate harm, which are termed as chronic hazards. An example is exposure to asbestos fibers, which may be inhaled many times over many years before harm is caused to the body. Some hazards can be both acute and chronic. Radiation in small repeated doses can cause chronic harm in the form of cancers. However, a large single dose can cause acute harm in the form of burns and poisoning. You have been introduced to hazards. Let's discuss other hazards which are caused by workplace exposure 
or with the combination of workplace exposure and personal lifestyle. Look at these examples. Stress may arise at work and usually does to some extent and be quite tolerable to an individual. However, combine that with stress from the individual's personal life, such as undergoing a divorce or bereavement and harm to health can easily arise. The other example is musculoskeletal injury, such as carpal tunnel syndrome, which may be experienced by a VDU operator using a keyboard all day. Combine the workplace activity with a hobby of surfing the net, and it is easy to see that this additional exposure increases the risk of wrist injury. In both these examples, it is not easy to determine which of these activities the causative factors are and what their contributions are to the resulting harm. An activity that is not a hazard because it does not cause harm can become one under different circumstances. Let's discuss more about hazards which are caused by workplace exposure. Consequently, recognizing hazards is not always straightforward or easy. If a checklist of hazards is used, it should be reviewed periodically, preferably by different people so that there is a chance that what one reviewer misses, another will identify. Hazards take many forms including, for example, chemicals, electricity and working from a ladder. A hazard can be ranked relative to other hazards or to a possible level of danger. You have examined hazards. Now, let's explore the significance of a hazard identification plan. A hazard identification plan must begin with a procedural walk around of the workplace. Next, the employees must be questioned as to whether they themselves are aware of any lurking hazards. Once every possible hazard has been identified, they then need to be controlled in order to ensure that they do not pose a high level of risk to the employees. However, the procedures and regulations that may be needed to be taken differ drastically in every industry. Overall, you can conclude that hazards are indeed dangerous to humans as well as the environment. Hence, hazard recognition and identification is a must in order to control, reduce and eliminate these hazards. You have explored a hazard identification plan. Now, let's delve into hazard recognition methods. There are other various hazard identification methods. The three different methods of hazard recognition are given below. Equipment inspections. Equipment inspections must be planned and organized. Its aim is to check the equipment conditions, safety protective equipment, guarding, etc. Pre-use analysis This method can be applied before any new equipment, instrumentation device, plant facility, personal protective equipment, machinery, tools, etc. are used. Work permitting this method also involves asking oneself a series of questions and making a checklist in order to assure that hazards are not overlooked. For example, the checklist used for permitting people to enter confined space will include checking the presence of toxic gases, oxygen sufficiency, etc. You've been introduced to the Hazard Identification Plan. It's time to take a safe shot. Choose the correct option.
Which of the following hazard recognition methods involves asking oneself a series of questions and making a checklist in order to assure that hazards are not overlooked? Not quite. Work permitting involves asking oneself. Now, let's learn about hazard. You've been introduced to the hazard identification. Well done. Now, let's learn about hazard control in detail. The employers are under a general duty of care to reduce risks to the employees as far as is reasonably practicable. The underlying principle of risk control is to remove the source of the risk, that is, risk avoidance. In terms of health and safety, it means to remove the hazard from the person. If this is not possible, the next means of control is to reduce the risk posed by that hazard, that is, risk reduction. You have examined hazard control. Now, let's look at a hierarchy of control measures. A hierarchy of control measures that should always be considered in following order. Avoiding risks. An essential element in risk avoidance is training in the safe and proper methods for carrying out an activity. Examples of this can be seen in the activities of mountaineers, motor racing drivers, scuba divers, and others who face high levels of risks but are highly trained. In these extreme examples, training is the main means by which the risk of getting exposed is avoided. However, what is not acceptable is the subjecting of innocent, that is, untutored individuals to high levels of risks as a result of ignorance, incompetence, or worse, for commercial gain. Risk avoidance may also be achieved by substitution.
elimination or substitution. This is the best and most effective way of avoiding a severe hazard and its associated risks. Elimination occurs when a process or activity is totally abandoned because the associated risk is too high. This may be achieved in many ways, that is, buying ready-made components and not manufacturing in-house. Substitution describes the use of a less hazardous form of the substance. There are many examples of substitution, such as the use of water-based rather than solvent-based paints, the use of asbestos substitutes, and the use of compressed air as a power source rather than electricity. Care must be taken not to introduce additional or new hazards and risks as a result of a substitution. Reducing time or limiting exposure This involves reducing the time during the working day that the employee is exposed to the hazard, either by giving the employee other work or rest periods. It is only suitable for the control of health hazards associated with, for example, noise, vibration, display screens, and hazardous substances. However, it is important to note that for many hazards, there are short-term exposure limits as well as normal workplace exposure limits over an 8-hour period. See Unit 2, Element 6 of these course notes. Short-term limits must not be exceeded while at the workplace. Isolation or segregation or both. Isolation. Isolation could have several applications. For example, isolating the person from a process by, say, operating a machine from within a controlled room, using enclosures and guards are other examples. Isolating a process from people. Here an example could be using a spray booth rather than manually spraying the paints. The isolation of power or energy sources or both, that is, electrical, steam, air, etc. See Engineering Controls. Segregation. The simplest and most efficient engineering control is the segregation of people from the process and a chemical fume cupboard is an example of this. Toxic substances are handled by technicians, scientists, researchers in a glove box. Engineering Controls this describes the control of risks by means of engineering design rather than a reliance on preventative actions by the employee. There are several ways of achieving such controls. Control the risks at the source. For example, the use of more efficient dust filters or the purchase of less noisy equipment. Control the risk of exposure by Isolating the equipment by the use of an enclosure, a barrier, or guard. Insulating any electrical or temperature hazard. Ventilate away any hazardous fumes or gases, either naturally or by the use of extractor fans and hoods. Safe system of work. A method of safe working is a normal requirement of national health and safety legislation. The system of work describes the safe method of performing the job activity. If the risks involved are high or medium, the details of the system should be in writing and should be communicated to the employee formally in a training session. Systems for low-risk activities may be conveyed verbally. There should be records that the employee or contractor has been trained or instructed in the safe system of work and that he or she understands it and will abide by it. Training and Information An essential feature of any risk management system 
is the training provided to those who handle or use those equipment or substances or both, etc. Information includes such items as signs, posters, systems of work and general health and safety arrangements. Safety Signs and Signals Signs are defined in a number of ways to primarily provide information or instruction by means of a signboard, a color, an illuminated sign, an audible and acoustic signal, a verbal communication, a hand signal. Personal Protective Equipment or PPE All equipment including clothing affording protection against the weather which is intended to be worn or held by a person at work and which protects them against one or more risks to their health and safety and any addition or accessory designed to meet that objective can be called as PPE. In other words, Personal Protective Equipment or PPE Includes Protective clothing such as aprons Protective clothing for adverse weather conditions Gloves Safety footwear Safety helmets High visibility waistcoats, etc. Protective equipment such as eye protectors Life jackets Respirators Underwater breathing apparatus And safety harnesses You have been introduced to the hierarchy of hazard control. Now, you will move on to discuss the hazard control measures for some of the specific hazards. Let's explore the following hazards one by one. Electrical hazards Fire hazards Machinery hazards Transportation hazards Construction and demolition hazards you will be introduced to the following health hazards in the health module. Noise and vibration hazards. Ergonomical hazards. Manual handling hazards. Chemical and biological hazards. You have explored hazard control. It's time to take a safe shot. Choose the correct option. Risk avoidance in terms of health and safety means to remove the hazard from the person. Well done. The correct answer is... You have explored the concept of hazard control in detail. Now, we will take up few specific hazards one by one. Let us begin with electrical hazards. We all use electricity in our daily lives at work, in the home and in a host of other pursuits. Most of the time, we take it for granted. Occasionally, things go wrong, usually for simple reasons. By noting and practicing the good practices, the risk of incurring an electric shock could be removed. Now, Let's explore principles of electricity. For an electrical current to do its job of providing lighting, heating and power, it must move safely from its source, through the conducting path and back from whence it came. In short, electric current requires a suitable circuit to assist its flow without danger. The circuit must be of suitable conducting material, for example, copper, covered with a suitable insulating material to stop the current leaking out, such as PVC or polyvinyl chloride or rubber. For an electrical current measured in amperes to flow in a circuit, it requires pressure or voltage measured in volts. As it flows, it encounters resistance from the circuit and apparatus, and this characteristic is measured in ohms. This relationship between volts, amps and ohms is brought together in the famous Ohm's Law often learnt at school. Ohm's Law states that the current in a circuit 
is proportional to the voltage driving it and inversely proportional to the resistance it has to overcome. This can be stated as current is equal to voltage divided by resistance. You have examined Ohm's law. Now, let's have a look at some of the common terms related to electrical hazards. Electrical equipment Anything used or intended to be used in connection with electrical energy can be called as electrical equipment. This includes Electrical appliances Fridges Kettles, pistol drills, cookers, washing machines, dishwashers, microwave ovens, etc. Generators, fixed and portable. Batteries as used in forklift trucks and battery powered transport and battery backup systems. Transformers, rectifiers, cables, conductors, Meters and measuring equipment. Control equipment. Switch gear, consoles, relays, etc. Distribution equipment. Bus bars, overhead power lines. The definition is very wide in scope, covering low voltage battery operated equipment to high tension electricity distribution equipment as used by the national grid. Direct current or DC. This involves the flow of electrons along a conductor from one end to the other. This type of current is mainly restricted to batteries and similar devices. Alternating current or AC. This is produced by a rotating alternator and causes an oscillation of the electrons rather than a flow of electrons so that energy is passed from one electron to the adjacent one and so on through the length of the conductor. Low voltage. A voltage normally not exceeding 600 volts AC between conductors and earth or 1000 volts AC between phases is called as low voltage in the electrical engineering field. Mains voltage, see the definition, falls into this category. High voltage. This is considered to be a voltage normally exceeding 600 volts AC between conductors and earth or 1000 volts AC between phases. Mains voltage This is the common voltage available in domestic premises and many workplaces and is normally taken from 3 pin socket points. Maintenance It is a combination of any actions carried out to retain an item of electrical equipment in or restore it to an acceptable and safe condition. Testing Being a measurement carried out to monitor the conditions of an item of electrical equipment without physically altering the construction of the item or the electrical system to which it is connected. Here's a look at a few more terms related to electrical hazards. Inspection This is a maintenance action involving the careful scrutiny of an item of electrical equipment using, if necessary, all the senses to detect any failure to meet an acceptable and safe condition.
An inspection does not include any dismantling of the item of equipment. Examination Being an inspection together with the possible partial dismantling of an item of electrical equipment, including measurement and non-destructive testing as required, in order arriving at a reliable conclusion as to its condition and safety. Isolation This involves cutting off the electrical supply from all or a discrete section of the installation by separating the installation or section from every source of electrical energy. This is the normal practice so as to ensure the safety of persons working on or in the vicinity of electrical components which are normally live and where there is a risk of direct contact with live electricity. Competent electrical person A person possessing sufficient electrical knowledge and experience to avoid the risks to health and safety associated with electrical equipment and electricity in general. Conductors and insulators Conductors are nearly always metals, copper being a particularly good conductor and are usually in wire form, but they can be gases or liquids, water being a particularly good conductor of electricity. Superconductors is a term given to certain metals which have a very low resistance to electricity at low temperatures. Very poor conductors are known as insulators and include materials such as rubber, timber and plastics. Insulating material is used to protect people from some of the hazards associated with electricity. Short Circuit Electrical equipment components and an electrical power supply, normally the mains or a battery, are joined together by a conductor to form a circuit. If the circuit is broken in some way so that the current flows directly to earth rather than to a piece of equipment, a short circuit is made. Since the resistance is greatly reduced but the voltage remains the same, a rapid increase in current occurs, which could cause significant problems if suitable protection were not available. Earthing The provision of effective earthing to give protection against indirect contact can be achieved in a number of ways, including connecting the extraneous conductive parts of premises water pipe, taps and radiators to the main earthing terminal of the electrical installation. This would create an equipotential zone and eliminate the risk of shock that could occur if a person touched two different parts of the metalwork liable to be charged at different voltages under earth fault conditions. It is crucial to ensure that in the event of earth fault, such as when a live part touches an enclosed conductive part, that the electricity supply is automatically disconnected. Such disconnection is achieved by the use of overcurrent devices, correctly rated fuses or circuit breakers, or by correctly placed and rated residual current devices. Maintenance of earth continuity is also vital. You have explored different terms related to electrical hazards. It's time to take a safe shot. Choose the correct option. Timber is a superconductor.
Well done. You have explored definitions of various terms related to electrical hazards. Now, you will explore different hazards of electricity. Electricity, which is apparently a benign source of energy, when accidentally brought into contact with conducting material, such as people, animals or metals, permits releases of energy which may result in serious damage or loss of life. Constant awareness is necessary to avoid and prevent danger from accidental releases of electrical energy. Important consequences or harm associated with electricity are Electric shock Electric burns Electrical fires Secondary hazards You have been introduced to different consequences of coming in contact with electricity. First, let's look at the electric shock. Electric shock is a possible outcome of electric current flowing through the human body, which causes disturbance in the normal functions of the body's organs and nervous system. Death occurs if the rhythm of the heart is upset for long enough to stop the flow of blood to the brain. It is crucial to act quickly in such emergencies, that is, with first aid and resuscitation treatment. Fortunately, death and serious injury from electric shock are relatively rare. Most electrical injuries, in fact, arise from burns received at the point of contact with the body. However, some of these burns can be deep-seated and immediate careful treatment is required. You have explored the electric shock. Now, let's look at electric burns. Direct Flesh can be burnt if contact is made with live electrical parts. This occurs due to the heating effect of the current flow through the skin and tissues and can occur at either the point of contact or the point of exit out of the body. Electrical burns are frequently deep tissue burns as the body presents a resistance to the current which causes heat to be generated. The heating effect follows the same principle as an electric heater that uses resistive wire to cause a heating effect. Indirect Physical burns can also occur from the heat generated from an electrical arc created by a fault condition. You have explored electric burns. Now, let's examine electric fires. The more general causes of electrical fires and the control measures are circuits that are inadequate for the current requirement. For example, a 5 ampere wiring system carrying current of 13 ampere. This can be a problem when substandard cable or wires are used by incompetent persons during the installation. Overloaded circuits. This may be caused connecting an excessive number of appliances to the electrical distribution system beyond the rated capacity. A big offender in this arena is the overuse of multi-socket adapters, etc. Fitting incorrectly rated fuses. Damaged insulation, wiring or equipment. This can result in the generation of short circuits and subsequent overheating. Loose connections. This type of situation can lead to arcing across the live and neutral terminals, again causing overheating. Flammable materials being placed too close to electrical equipment. By the very nature of their operation, some electrical fittings need ventilation around key components to keep cool. If these ventilation sources are obstructed, then overheating will arise. You have been introduced to three consequences of electricity.
namely shock, burn and fire. Now, let us explore the fourth one called secondary hazards. It is important to note that there are many other non-electricity related hazards associated with electrical appliances such as noise and vibration, etc. In addition, shock from a power supply may cause a person to lose their balance and fall while working at height. Trailing leads used for portable equipment and raised socket points offer serious trip hazards and both should be used with great care near pedestrian walkways. Drive mechanisms of electric motors may cause entanglement hazards. You have been introduced to electrical fires. It's time to take a safe shot. Choose the correct option. Which of the following is not a cause of electrical fires? Well done! You have explored secondary hazards. Now, let's look at the factors which affect the selection of suitable electrical equipment. Many factors such as flammable, explosive and damp atmospheres and adverse weather conditions affect the selection of suitable electrical equipment. Other issues that may also have to be considered include Exposure to high or low temperatures Exposure to dirty or corrosive processes Problems associated with vegetation or animals For example, tree roots touching and displacing underground power cables, farm animals urinating near power supply lines, and rats gnawing through cables. Extremes of temperature will also affect the selection of equipment, for example, the lubrication of motor bearings and corrosive atmospheres can lead to the breakdown of insulating materials. Process plant and equipment will be affected due to power failures and in such cases, design of the installation should be such that a safe shutdown can be achieved in the event of a total mains failure. This may require the use of a battery-backed shutdown system or emergency standby electric generators, assuming that this is cost-effective. You have been introduced to factors which affect the selection and suitability of equipment. Now, let's explore basic preventive measures against electric shock. There are two basic preventive measures against electric shock, namely, Protection against direct contact, for example, by providing proper insulation for parts of equipment liable to be charged with electricity, and protection against indirect contact, for example, by providing effective earthing for metallic enclosures, which are liable to be charged with electricity if the basic insulation fails for any reason. When it is not possible to provide adequate insulation as protection against direct contact, a range of measures is available, including protection by barriers or enclosures and protection by position, that is, placing live parts out of reach. You have explored the control measures for protection against electric shock, either from direct or indirect contact. Now let's examine different types of protective systems and techniques that may be used to protect people, plant and premises from electrical hazards. Fuses 1 In the event of a fault or overload, it is necessary for a circuit to be disconnected. Otherwise, excessive current could flow and the overheating thus resulted could cause fire. Such protection by automatic disconnection is provided by the fuse or circuit breaker. Fuse is a protected strip of thin metal which melts at a value well below an excessive value of current and cuts off supply. Fuse should be of the type and rating appropriate to the circuit and appliance it protects.
it would clearly be a mistake to provide a 30 ampere fuse or a makeshift one of the same value when only a 13 ampere fuse is required. Fuses 2 It should also be remembered that fuses will protect against overheated circuits and fire but not against receipt of a potentially lethal or dangerous electric shock. The fault current required to blow a fuse will invariably be far higher than the minimal current which would present danger to human beings. Fuses protect the equipment but not necessarily the user. Circuit Breakers Circuit Breaker is a device that looks like an enclosed switch. It has a mechanism that trips the switch from on to off position if an excess current flows in the circuit. As with the fuse, the circuit breaker should be of the correct type and rating for the circuit and appliance it protects. It must not be forgotten that fuses and circuit breakers by themselves provide protection from excess current flow and they may not provide complete protection against electric shock. However, a special type of circuit breaker known as a residual current circuit breaker or RCCB provides a good standard of protection that is at very low fault currents against earth leakage faults also. Insulation Insulation is used to protect people from electric shock. The short-circuiting of live conductors and the dangers associated with fire and explosions. Insulation is achieved by covering the conductor with an insulating material. Insulation is often accompanied by the enclosure of the live conductors so that they are out of reach to people. A breakdown in insulation can cause electric shock, fire, explosion or instrument damage. Reduced low voltage systems. Another protective measure against electric shock is the use of reduced low voltage systems, the most commonly used being the 110 volt center point earthed system. Safe extra low voltage systems are also available. These operate at up to 50 volts AC and obviously have limited though safer application. Residual Current Devices or RCDs 1 If electrical equipment must operate at mains voltage, the best form of protection against electric shock is the Residual Current Device or RCD. It is also known as Earth Leakage Circuit Breakers. It monitors and compares the current flowing in the live and neutral conductors supplying the protected equipment and will cut the supply to the equipment in a very short period of time when a difference of only a few milliampere's occurs. It is the speed of the reaction which offers the protection against electric shock. Residual Current Devices or RCDs 2 RCDs can also be used to protect installations against fire since they will interrupt the electrical supply before sufficient energy to start a fire has been dissipated. For protection against electric shock, the RCD must have a rated residual current of 30 milliampere or less 
and an operating time of 40 milliseconds or less at a residual current of 250 milliampere. The equipment must be properly protected by insulation and enclosure in addition to the RCD. The RCD will not prevent shock or limit the current resulting from an accidental contact, but it will ensure that the duration of the shock is limited to the time taken for the RCD to operate. Double Insulation To remove the need for earthing on some portable power tools, double insulation is used. Double insulation employs two independent layers of insulation over the live conductors, each layer alone being adequate to insulate the electrical equipment safely. Since such tools are not protected by an earth, they must be inspected and maintained regularly and must be discarded if damaged. You have been introduced to different types of protective systems and techniques to protect you from electrical hazards. Now, let's look at inspection and maintenance strategies to avoid electrical hazards. Electrical inspection, testing and maintenance are necessary to ensure that the design, construction and performance specifications of the items being tested are maintained at an adequate standard for the anticipated continued use. Electrical testing also enables faults to be detected so that remedial measures can be taken before the fault develops and damage or personal injury arises. User Checks A simple visual inspection can identify most of the defects. Such defects, when noted, should be reported immediately and the equipment should be electrically isolated until a competent electrician or electrical fitter performs suitable repairs. Some of the defects to look for are Missing or damaged covers Damaged trailing cables and leads Damaged or blocked motor cowls Security of controls and switches Are they firmly fixed? Signs of overheating or overload such as burning or arcing. Security of electrical supplies and switch gear such as isolators, switches, conduits, etc. Formal inspection and tests. Equipment such as electric motors and various types of industrial, commercial and domestic apparatus requires individual or batch testing. Such test procedures include resistance and insulation tests for correct polarity, connection and operation. It is important to ensure that those undertaking the testing have adequate skills and proper equipment. Testing of Electrical Installations 1 a prerequisite to such testing is visual inspection to ensure that all circuits and equipment comply with an accepted standard and are properly installed and that circuit protection and earthing arrangements appear in order. The method adopted for testing should not, of course, be liable to endanger people or plant. Thus, the testing operation must be under proper control and the testing equipment suitable for the required use. Ordinary test lamps and leads with excessively exposed test prods or even bare ends have caused numerous flashovers. Properly designed, protected and approved test equipment employing current limiting resistors, well shrouded test prods and properly insulated handles are available and should always be used. Testing of Electrical Installations 2 Apart from tests to determine correct polarity, 
the measurement of earth fault loop impedance is required to ensure that the earthing arrangements are safe and can affect automatic disconnection of electricity supply in case of a fault. The test results should be recorded, thus enabling future comparisons to determine any deterioration or degradation of the appliance. Portable Appliance Testing or PAT-1 Approximately 25% of accidents involving electricity are associated with portable electrical appliances which include electric drills, kettles, floor polishers and lamps. In fact, any item that will connect into a 13 amp socket. 110 volt industrial portable electrical equipment should also be considered as portable appliances. Electrical tests of appliances should confirm the integrity or otherwise of earthing and insulation. To simplify this task, a competent person may use a proprietary portable appliance testing or PAT device. Portable Appliance Testing or PAT-2 Two basic tests are offered by PAT device, namely Earth Bond Test and Insulation Test. During Earth Bond Test, a substantial test current, typically around 25 amperes, is passed through the earth pin of the plug to an earth test probe, which should be connected by the user to any exposed metalwork on the casing of the unit under test. From this, the resistance of the earth bond is determined by the PAT device. During the insulation test, a test voltage, typically 500 volts DC, is applied between the live and neutral terminals bonded together and earth from which the insulation resistance is calculated by the PAT device. You have explored inspection and maintenance strategies. Now, you will examine tools of personal protection. While handling electricity, apart from electric shock and fire, there is also a danger to the eyes and skin from the effects of ultraviolet light from the arc. This can cause painful discomfort, pain and illness. Exposure to UV rays is also known as arc eye a form of conjunctivitis and can cause sunburn effect on the exposed skin. As an essential precaution, the welder's eyes and others working around must be protected by a suitable electric arc welding filter lens in the welding helmet or in a handheld face shield. Additional protection must be provided for the skin in the form of suitable welder's gloves and sensible footwear and clothing. For regular welding jobs in a workshop, a properly constructed welding booth is necessary to protect the eyes of people working or passing in the vicinity. You have been introduced to personal protection tools. Now, let's look at the importance of training of electrical personnel. A key to safe working on electrical installations and apparatus is that all those engaged on such work shall have been adequately trained. The training, backed up by relevant experience in a working environment, should be aimed to ensure that the trainee acquires the skills, related knowledge and attitudes necessary for safe and efficient working. Both off-the-job and on-the-job training must be properly supervised, and at each stage the employees must be made aware of the extent and limitations of the job in hand, the hazards that may be present, and the precautions that have to be taken to ensure safe working. Having explored the hierarchy of control measures related to electrical hazard, it's time to take a safe shot. Drag the correct option 
and drop it into the blank to complete the statement. Well done. You have been introduced to electrical hazards. Now, let's examine the fire hazards. For combustion to take place, heat, fuel and oxygen are required. Heat, in the terminology of fire, is often misinterpreted as flame. Heat can be manifested not only by flame, but also by friction, electrical current and chemical reaction. All the three elements of the reaction must be in the desired right proportions. These three components together are commonly referred to as the fire triangle. Removing one of these constituent elements will collapse the reaction and the combustion process will cease or be extinguished. This is commonly achieved by Starvation Removing or limiting the fuel Smothering Removing or limiting the oxygen Cooling Removing or reducing the heat Also note that firefighting techniques involve a combination of the extinction methods. You have examined three elements of the combustion process. Now, let's see the definitions of few terminologies that are commonly used in the field of fire engineering. Spontaneous Combustion This is a phenomenon where materials will give off sufficient gaseous emissions to support ignition and combustion simultaneously. It will occur, for example, in an enclosed room which is undergoing a fire, where the temperature increases as the fire develops and heat transfer occurs by one or a combination of convection, conduction and radiation methods to a point where all the materials are heated so that they give off a gas which then ignites due to the heat present, the room flashes over. Certain organic materials also react naturally with oxygen to form heat and self-sustain the combustion process, such as white phosphorus. A flash fire a flash fire can occur following loss of containment incidents involving volatile or flashing flammable liquids. Unless ignition occurs immediately, there is a possibility of a flammable vapor cloud forming that could later ignite at some distance from the source. You have been introduced to principles of fire. Now, Let's look at different classifications of fire. There are categories of fires that fall into distinct classes according to the material undergoing combustion. This scheme of classification is particularly useful when selecting the appropriate type of portable firefighting equipment for premises. The recognized classes are as follows. Class A Class B Class C Class D Electrical Class F or Class K Let's look at the first classification of fire, that is, Class A. Fires involving solid materials, usually of an organic nature, in which combustion takes place with the formation of glowing embers. These are the most common of all fires as Class A materials are present in all premises and occupancies. Example, wood, paper, textiles, etc. The most effective extinguisher type for this class of fire is water, although aqueous film forming foam or AFFF and dry powder could also be used. Note, it is to be remembered that the discharge of a dry powder extinguisher within a confined space 
may reduce visibility sufficiently to temporarily jeopardize escape or any other emergency action taking place and therefore is ill-advised in such situations. You have explored Class A. Now, let's explore Class B. Fires in liquids or liquefiable solids These are fires in liquids or liquefiable solids and fall into three main categories. Fires in liquids of appreciable depth, that is, more than one-fourth inch. Spill fires or running or flowing fires in liquids of no real depth. Pressurized flammable liquid fires from damaged vessels or product lines. Suitable extinguishing agents for Class B fires include dry powder, CO2 and AFFF or aqueous film forming foam. Dry powder extinguishers are considered the most effective medium against the majority of Class B fires, although it may be unsuitable for applications whereby part of the fuel surface is shielded from the powder discharge. In these instances, the powder will only provide partial extinction, which will almost certainly result in reignition of the fuel. Here's more about Class B. AFFF would be considered more appropriate for Class B fires as it is able to provide partial extinction to a fire, preventing it to regain its full intensity for some time until the foam over the surface is destroyed. AFFF has the added advantage that it can be applied to the surface of an uninvolved flammable liquid within the close vicinity to protect it from igniting or producing flammable vapors due to the radiant heat from a nearby incident. AFFF does, however, has its limitations and is considered ineffective against running fires, for instance. It is to be noted that due to the potential severity of Class B fires, compared to a similar-sized Class A fire, portable fire extinguishers should not be relied upon when the surface area exceeds 1 meter square and, where applicable, no attempt should be made to fight the fire unless there is reasonable certainty that the fuel source can be shut off promptly. You have been introduced to Class B. Now, let's explore Class C. Fires involving gases or liquefied gases. When dealing with fires involving gases, there will always be a possibility of explosions due to ignition of an unburned gas cloud. Most liquefied gases are heavier than air and will search for the lowest point to congregate. For example, cellars, basements, drains or sewers. The hazard of leaking gas unknown to those around could have now spread some distance from its origin. Fire involving flammable gas or vapor can only burn if the concentration of the gas or vapor mixture in air lies between two distinct limits, the lower or LEL and upper or UEL flammability or explosion limits and is subjected to an adequate ignition source. For a vapor mixture below the LEL, there is an insufficient concentration of fuel for a flame to propagate successfully through it. As the concentration of fuel is increased above the lower limits, self-propagating flames are possible, which have a discrete flame speed. Here's more about Class C. As the concentration reaches its stoichiometric level, that is, optimum fuel to air ratio, the flame speed is at its maximum and combustion is at its most efficient. 
As the concentration of fuel increases towards the upper flammability limit, the flame speed decreases and ultimately there becomes insufficient oxygen to support the combustion process. The most prevalent mode to deal with Class C fires is to remove the fuel source instead of the removal of heat as in Class A fires or the removal of oxygen as in Class B fires. This is typically achieved by the shutting off a ruptured pipe or cylinder head. The area should then subsequently be vented to the atmosphere or, if possible, saturated with an inert gas. Should the fuel source be emanating from cylinders or canisters and it is not possible to shut off the supply, attempts may be made to cool the cylinder with as large a quantity of water as possible until the fire brigade are in attendance. Flames should only be extinguished if the fuel supply is isolated or in the process of being isolated as an unburned gas could lead to further complications of the situation. Should it be necessary to suppress any flames to perhaps gain access for cutoff, the use of dry powders, AFFF or CO2 are most appropriate. You have explored Class C. Now, let's explore Class D. Fires involving metals. A typical metal fire would involve magnesium, sodium, aluminium, phosphorus or other similar metallic elements. The extreme intensity with which the combustion process takes place manifests itself in the production of intense light, which could possibly cause irreparable damage to the eyes and large volumes of highly toxic smoke. Because the properties of combustible metals differ, firefighting agent recommended for one type of Class D fire may be ineffective or even dangerous if used on the wrong metal. Dry powder extinguishing agents are available for metals and are usually confined for use on a specific type of metal only. Attempts should not be made to use any other type of extinguisher on metal fires. If it is possible, however, apply dry sand or earth to the metal, and this may prove effective in certain circumstances. Extreme caution should be taken whilst attempting this. Similarly, when applying powder to the fire, as the burning metal may be scattered, causing ignition to previously uninvolved combustibles. Because of the severe nature and unpredictability of metal fires, unless they can be controlled at a very early stage after ignition, they are best left to the fire brigade or other specially trained personnel. You have explored Class D. Now, Let's explore electrical fires and Class F fires. Electrical fires Fires involving electrical equipment or apparatus Fires involving electrical equipment should preferably be dealt with using CO2, although dry powder may also be effective. The following rules should be observed when attempting to fight electrical fires. Switch off mains electricity supply and unplug from socket if possible. Do not approach closer than one meter if unable to do either of the above. CO2 is the best extinguisher agent as it penetrates deep into machinery. Once the power supply to any electrical equipment is cut, it can theoretically be classed as an A or B fire depending on the nature of the burning material. Class F or Class K Fires involving kitchen or cooking related fats Fires which involve high-temperature cooking oils or fats in large catering establishments or restaurants. 
special fire blankets are available to extinguish these fires. You have explored the classification of fire. It's time to take a safe shot. Choose the correct... Well done. The correct answer... Now let's explore the causes of fire in the workplace. Although there are many causes for the fires to start, two most common causes are smoking and arson. Electrical faults in equipment or building wiring are also very common causes of fire. Some other causes of fire include lights or other hot surfaces resting on combustible materials, blocked ventilation holes in equipment, incorrectly stored or used flammable substances, sparks from welding or other building works, static electricity, incorrectly stored flammable waste, dust explosions, You have explored causes of fires. Now, let's look at the consequences of fires in the workplace. There are many consequences of fire, the more common and readily identifiable ones being Death Although this is a very real risk, relatively few people die in building fires that are not dwellings but a high number of people do suffer burns, sometimes very serious. Personal injury It can be assumed that gas and smoke are the main risks here. Building damage It can be very significant, particularly if the building materials have poor resistance to fire, and there are little or no built-in fire protection. Flora and fauna damage It can be significant, particularly in a hot drought or forest fire. Loss of business and jobs It is estimated that about 40% of businesses, particularly the smaller ones, do not start up again after a significant fire, irrespective of whether they are insured or not, since they often cannot afford the time and expense of setting up again when they probably still have old debts to service. Transport Disruption Rail routes, roads and even airports are sometimes closed because of a serious fire. The worst case was probably that of 11 September 2001 when airports around the world were disrupted. Environmental Impacts Environmental damage from the fire or fighting the fire or both, firefighting water, the products of combustion and exploding building materials such as asbestos, cement roofs, can contaminate significant areas around the fire site. You have been introduced to the causes and consequences of fires. Now, let's examine the control measures to minimize the risk of fire in a workplace. There are various ways by which we can reduce the risks caused by materials and substances which burn. These include removing flammable materials and substances or reducing them to the minimum required for the operation of the business. Replacing materials and substances with less flammable alternatives. Ensuring flammable materials, liquids and vapors and gases are handled, transported, stored and used properly. Ensuring adequate separation distances between flammable materials. Storing highly flammable substances in fire-resisting stores and, where necessary, keeping a minimum quantity in fire-resisting cabinets in the workroom.
Here, let's explore some more control measures to minimize the risk of fire in a workplace. Removing, covering or treating large areas of flammable wall and ceiling linings to reduce the rate of flame spread across the surface. Replacing or repairing furniture with damaged upholstery where the foam filling is exposed. Ensuring that flammable waste materials and rubbish are not allowed to build up and are carefully stored until properly disposed. Taking action to avoid storage areas being vulnerable to arson or vandalism. Improving the fire resistance of the construction of the workplace. You have discussed various control measures related to the removal of fuel to reduce the risk of fire in the workplace. Now, let's take a closer look at how to reduce potential sources of oxygen supply to a fire. Potential source of oxygen supply to a fire can be reduced by Closing all doors, windows and other openings not required for ventilation, particularly out of working hours. Shutting down ventilation systems which are not essential to the function of the workplace. Not storing oxidizing materials near or with any heat source or flammable materials. Controlling the use and storage of oxygen cylinders, ensuring that they are not leaking, are not used to sweeten the atmosphere and that where they are located is adequately ventilated. Having explored the ways of reducing the fire risk by influencing the fuel and oxygen, let us now explore how to influence sources of ignition to reduce the fire risk. Plant and equipment which is not properly maintained can cause fires. The following circumstances often contribute to fires. Poor housekeeping such as allowing ventilation points on machinery to become clogged with dust or other materials causing overheating. Frictional heat caused by loose drive belts, bearings which are not properly lubricated or other moving parts. Electrical malfunction Flammable materials used in contact with hot surfaces. Leaking valves or flanges which allow seepage of flammable liquids or gases. And static sparks, perhaps due to inadequate electrical earthing. There may be a need to have a planned maintenance program in place to make sure that plant and other equipment is properly maintained or to review the program if there is one already. You have explored the control measures to minimize the risk of fire in a workplace. It's time to take a safe shot. Choose the correct option. Plant and equipment which is not properly maintained can cause fires. Well done. Now, Let's look at how to safely store and use flammable liquids. Flammable liquids can present a significant risk of fire. Vapors evolved are usually heavier than air and can travel long distances, so are more likely to reach a source of ignition. Liquid leaks and evolution of vapors can be caused by faulty storage, bulk and containers, plant and process design, installation, maintenance or use. Ignition of the vapors from flammable liquids remains a possibility until the concentration of the vapor in the air has reduced to a level which will not support combustion. You have been introduced to flammable liquids. Now, let's look at how to store flammable liquids. The quantity of flammable liquids in workrooms should be kept to a minimum, normally no more than a half day's or half a shift's supply. Flammable liquids, include empty or part-used containers, should be stored safely. Up to 50 litres of highly flammable liquids can be stored in the workroom 
if enclosed containers in a fire resisting for example metal bin or cabinet fitted with means to contain any leaks quantities greater than 50 liters should be stored in a properly designated store either in the open air on well ventilated impervious ground away from ignition sources or in a suitably constructed store room dispensing should take place in a well ventilated area set aside for this purpose with appropriate facilities to contain and clear up any spillage Here's more about the storage of flammable liquids. Container lids should always be replaced after use, and no container should ever be opened in such a way that it cannot be safely resealed. Flammable liquids should be stored and handled in well-ventilated conditions. Where necessary, additional suitably designed exhaust ventilation should be provided to reduce the level of vapor concentration in the air. Storage containers should be kept covered and proprietary safety containers with self-closing lids should be used for dispensing and applying small quantities of flammable liquids. Rags and cloths which have been used to mop up or apply flammable liquids should be disposed of in metal containers with well-fitting lids and removed from the workplace at the end of each shift or working day. There should be no potential ignition sources in areas where flammable liquids are used or stored and flammable concentrations of vapor may be present at any time any electrical equipment used in these areas including fire alarm and emergency lighting systems needs to be suitable for use that is flame proof in flammable atmospheres now Let's explore how to store and use flammable gases. Flammable gas cylinders also need to be stored and used safely. The following guidance should be adopted. Both full and empty cylinders should be stored outside. They should be kept in a separate secure compound at ground level with sufficient ventilation. Open mesh is preferable. Valves should be uppermost during storage to retain them in the vapor phase of the LPG. Cylinders, particularly the valves, must be protected from mechanical damage. Cylinders must be protected from the heat of the summer sun. The correct fittings must be used. These include hose, couplers, clamps and regulators. Gas valves must be turned off after use at the end of the shift. Precautions must be taken to avoid welding flame flashback into the hoses or cylinders. People should be trained in the proper lighting up and safe systems of work procedures. Non-return valves and flame arresters also need to be fitted. Here's a look at a few more suggestions on storage and use of flammable gases. Cylinders must be changed in a well-ventilated area remote from any sources of ignition. Joints should be tested for gas leaks using soapy or detergent water. Never use a flame. Flammable material must be removed or protected before welding or similar work. Cylinders should be positioned outside buildings with gas piped through fixed metal piping. Both high and low ventilation must be maintained where LPG application are being used. Flame failure devices are necessary to shut off the gas supply in the event of flame failure. You have been introduced to safe storage and use of flammable gases. Now Let's explore the common fire detection and alarm systems. Most of the larger workplace buildings are equipped with an electrical fire warning system consisting of manual or break glass call points that operate electromechanical bells or electronic sounders. This type of system provides that the operation of any single call point will raise the alarm simultaneously 
all over the building so that a prompt evacuation can be initiated. Buildings where persons sleep, such as hotels and boarding houses, hospitals and even private dwellings, have special difficulties with respect to fire. In these premises, simple methods of raising the alarm and even manually operated electrical alarm systems may not be adequate, since fire may not be discovered quickly enough to prevent injury or damage. In these buildings, some form of automatic fire detection, or AFD, will be required to initiate the alarm. You have been introduced to common fire detection and alarm systems. Now, let's explore the common circumstances in which installation of an AFD system is needed. The installation of an AFD system may be required or advisable in the following circumstances. In any building where the results of a fire risk assessment show that life safety may be compromised by an outbreak of fire, that is not discovered promptly. In any building where it is necessary to provide compensation for some other fire precautionary measure, for example, where it is not considered practicable to provide the required level of fire separation. On the instructions of the insurers for the building. To minimize the potential loss from fire in a building that is not normally occupied, or one that is left empty overnight or during holiday periods, etc. In an empty building, it will be necessary to ensure that an auto-dialer is installed as part of the system. Where the consequential loss or loss of business, cost of replacement equipment, etc. from the effects of a serious fire would be very great. Here are a few more common circumstances in which installation of an AFD system will be required. In any building where large number of members of the public are present, especially where they may not be familiar with the layout of the premises, example, airport terminals, large stations, etc. In buildings where the value of the contents is extremely high or the contents are irreplaceable, Example, museums, libraries, and art galleries. In heritage buildings, where the conservation of the building would be difficult to protect from fire by the introduction of fire suppression systems and additional fire separation. Where the AFD will be required to initiate other actions automatically, such as releasing self-closing fire doors, controlling fire dampers, triggering fire extinguishing systems, operating fire ventilation systems, switching on special signs and escape lighting. You have been introduced to environments which require automatic fire detection and alarm systems. Now, let's explore the common components of an AFD system. A typical AFD system will consist of a control and indicating panel, fire detection devices, alarm or warning devices, interfaces with other safety equipment, for example, extinguishing equipment, a series of electrical circuits connecting the equipment together. It is common to classify AFD systems into two basic categories, the first of being conventional zoned systems in which, for design purposes, the building is broken into a number of separate fire zones. Each fire zone is served by its own detection circuit and the location of the fire is approximately indicated by the illumination of a numbered zone lamp displayed on the indicating panel. Reference to a zone chart showing the areas of the building covered by each numbered zone is necessary to assist in locating the fire.
The fire zone indicated must be searched in order for the precise location of the activated device to be discovered. You have been introduced to first category of AFD system. Now, let's explore the second category of AFD system. The second category is addressable systems in which the precise location of an activated detection device can be read from an integral display screen on the panel. It is common for such panels to also have an integral printer that prints out the location of the activated device. Each device has its own unique address so that it is not necessary to search the premises in order to know which device has activated. You have explored the common fire detection and alarm systems. It's time to take a safe shot. Drag the correct option and drop it into the blank to complete the statement. Well done. You have been introduced to AFD system. Now, let's take a closer look at some of the components the first one being fire detectors. Point smoke detectors are, by far, the most used fire detection device in all environments. Smoke detectors give an earlier warning of fire than heat detectors and for that reason are preferable in most situations. However, great care should always be taken to select the correct type of detector for the risk to be protected taking particular note of any local circumstances that may give rise to unwanted or unnecessary alarms. There are two generic types of point smoke detectors. Ionization smoke detectors. These respond most readily to the smaller invisible particles resulting from combustion, such as those associated with early heating in electrical equipment or clean burning fires. Photoelectric or optical detectors. These respond better to carbonaceous fires or smoky fires where larger particles are emitted. It should be ensured that the detector is installed in a horizontal plane. Where detectors are to be mounted on a sloping ceiling, a mild slope, generally less than 1 is to 25, may be tolerated. However, for steeper slopes, a tray portion can be used to ensure that the device is mounted in its correct or horizontal position. You have explored the smoke detectors. Now, you will examine the heat detectors. Point heat detectors require a significant rise in temperature at ceiling level before they operate. For this reason, they are unable to detect the very earliest stages of a fire, so cannot be relied upon to raise an alarm at a stage as early as a smoke detector. However, they still provide a very valuable means of automatically raising an alarm should a fire break out in an unoccupied room or space. Because they are less sensitive, they can be used in areas such as kitchens where smoke detectors would be likely to give rise to frequent unwanted alarms. Heat detectors are also more tolerant of dirty and dust-laden atmospheres and industrial quality heat detectors are available which can withstand corrosive atmospheres, minor knocks and very robust cleaning regimes, even hosing down. You have been introduced to heat detectors. Now, let's look at the multi-sensor detectors. Multi-sensor detectors are a relatively new development which combine more than one detector type into a single head. Multi-sensor heads are used in two distinct ways. 
Firstly, to increase detection sensitivity by using more than one type of sensor simultaneously, thereby increasing the chance of a fire being detected at the earliest possible time. The second use is to decrease sensitivity by changing to heat detection when buildings are occupied and the risk of an unforeseen fire occurring is very low and reverting to smoke detection when the buildings are unoccupied. You have examined multi-sensor detectors. Now, let's look at the flame detectors. Flame detectors are not commonly used, but there are some sites, such as large open expanses of hot and dusty areas of power stations and depots, where they would be the only suitable type of detector available. Flame detectors operate by detecting the infrared or ultraviolet radiation from fires. Some models can detect both simultaneously, but they generally require a flaming fire to be present before they operate. For this reason, they are unable to detect the very earliest stages of a fire, but flaming fires in external situations often develop very quickly and need to be detected if they are to be controlled quickly. Flame detectors are tolerant of wet and dirty conditions and are unaffected by wind speed they are normally very robustly constructed for prolonged outdoor use. You have been introduced to common types of detectors. Now, let's explore manual call points, which is another component of AFD. Manual call points, often called break glass call points, are an essential part of every fire alarm system. They are the means by which anyone discovering a fire is able to raise the alarm quickly throughout the protected premises. To achieve this end efficiently, call points must be instantly recognizable and persons seeking them should ideally have a clear idea of where they may be found and how they operate even in unfamiliar buildings. Here, Let's explore more about manual call points. It is generally required that all call points should be read and should not be fully recessed into the wall so that they are clearly visible when looking along the line of a wall. The method of operation should be clearly marked on the call point. The location of call points is also strictly required by the standard and the time delay between operating the call point and sounding the alarm is limited to a few seconds. Call points should be located adjacent to every final exit from the building, adjacent to every exit from each floor level and in corridors and circulation routes throughout the building, so that anyone discovering a fire would not have to travel more than 30 meters in any direction before finding one to operate. In clearly visible locations, at a height of 1.4 meters above finished floor level. You have been introduced to manual call points. Now, let's explore fire alarm sounder systems. A sounder system is the control equipment, circuits and sound generating devices. These are connected to the fire control panel or FCP as system outputs in order to raise the alarm in the event of a fire. Sounder systems may also include visual warning devices, which are usually located where the background noise level is high or in areas where hearing impaired persons may be expected to be on their own. In most areas, a minimum sound level of 65 dBA, that is, decibels, A, weighted to closely approximate the human hearing curve, should be achieved. However, if there is background noise, then the alarm level must be at least 5 dBA above the background level. In areas where a person may sleep, the level should be at least 75 dBA when measured at the bed head.
You've been introduced to types of fire detectors. It's time to take a safe shot. Choose the correct option. Which of the following detectors is divided into ionization detectors and photoelectric detectors? Well done. Smoke detectors are divided into ionization detectors and photoelectric detectors. You have been introduced to all components of an AFD system. Now, let's examine the sighting of extinguishers. Extinguishers are normally to be located in conspicuous positions on brackets or stands where they are going to be clearly visible to persons following an escape route. Extinguishers for general protection should be accessible for immediate use near stairways, corridors, exits or landings and consistency on a particular premise and within a particular company is desirable. Extinguishers should be arranged in such a way that it is not necessary to travel more than 30 meters from any point on the floor to reach an appropriate extinguisher. In buildings where there is other firefighting equipment, for example, hose reels, fire blankets, fire instruction notices, etc., it is advantageous to group the equipment and notices together at a fire point. Exception to this is in circumstances where there are major flammable or electrical risks, in which case the extinguisher should be sighted as near to them as safely possible. For detailed guidelines regarding selection, Installation and maintenance of portable fire extinguishers, refer IS15683-2006 portable fire extinguishers, performance and construction, specification. You have been introduced to sighting of portable fire extinguishers. Now, let's look at the maintenance and inspection of fire extinguishers. All extinguishers on premises must be inspected on a regular basis and the results of this inspection should be recorded. To facilitate this and to make it easier to keep track of all extinguishers, they should all be marked in some way to uniquely identify them, such as by numbers or letters or combination. The extinguishers should be checked at least monthly to ensure that they are in place have not been discharged, are not blocked by goods, materials or furniture, have not become damaged, have not lost pressure. All spares and supplies such as spare extinguishers, gas cylinders or replacement charges should also be inspected to ensure that they are available, are in good condition and are free from damage. At least once a year, a full inspection should be carried out. Any necessary replenishment and maintenance, including replacement of damaged, discharged or wound components, should be recorded. You have explored portable firefighting equipment. It's time to take a safe shot. Choose the correct option. All extinguishers on premises must be inspected on a regular basis and the results of this inspection should be recorded. Well done. The correct... You have been introduced to portable firefighting equipment. Now, let's look at them as per categories, depending upon their extinguishing agent. Portable fire extinguishers are designed to enable a person with the correct training to tackle a fire in its early stages. Extinguishers can currently be divided into four main categories, depending upon which extinguishing agent they contain. Water, foam, CO2, dry powder. They can be further subdivided according to their method of operation, stored pressure or cartridge operated. Let's first explore about water extinguishers. Aside from the obvious advantages of low cost and constant availability, Water is superior to any other known liquid 
for the extinction of fire in most situations. Water is completely non-toxic and can be stored at atmospheric pressure and normal temperatures. Its boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius is well below the 250 to 450 degrees Celsius range of temperatures at which most solid materials combust, enabling effective cooling of the burning surface to take place. Water may extinguish fire by a combination of mechanisms, cooling the solid or liquid combustible, cooling the flame itself, and generating steam that prevents oxygen access and also blocks radiation. The standard water fire extinguisher is predominantly of a 9 litre capacity with an approximate filled weight of 15 kg. The range of discharge would be between 10 and 12 meters, with a typical time of discharge being 60 seconds. Appreciably, operating temperatures of water extinguishers are in the region of plus 1 degree Celsius to plus 60 degree Celsius. It is, however, possible to chemically modify the contents of the extinguisher by the addition of an antifreeze type substance such that it is able to operate down to minus 10 degrees Celsius should these temperatures be a possibility within its operating environment. You have been introduced to water extinguishers. Now, let's explore foam or AFFF extinguishers. When added to water, Aqueous film forming foam or AFFF forms a solution that creates foam when discharged through an aspirating nozzle. It is ideal on class A fires where the agent both cools and penetrates to reduce temperatures below the ignition level and on class B fires where it floats on the liquid producing polymeric layer of vapor sealing, water bearing material that can halt or prevent combustion. Standard AFFF is not effective on flammable liquids or gases escaping under pressure, nor on fires involving alcohol-type compounds which have the ability to penetrate its foam blanket. There is a specific formulation of AFFF which is designed especially for alcohols. AFFF is available as either cartridge or stored pressure operated and range in capacity from 2 litre to the most common 9 litre size. The means of extinguishing is to form a thick blanket over the fire. As a result, it is necessary to deploy the jet at a hard surface, such as the far side of the containing vessel or a near wall, allowing the blanket to form covering the surface. It is very important not to direct the jet into the centre of the fire or any blanket that is forming as the jet action will destroy the smothering effect and permit the fire to reignite. You have been introduced to foam or AFFF extinguishers. Now, let's look at carbon dioxide extinguishers. Carbon dioxide is a compressed inert gas intended for use on electrical fires as well as those of class B and C. CO2 prevents combustion by displacing the oxygen in the air to form an inert atmosphere where vapors are unable to burn. As a consequence of being a gas, CO2 does not conduct electricity and is therefore the only safe agent to be used on electrical fires. It is however to be remembered that a reduction in oxygen levels can, within confined spaces, cause undesirable effects on humans but it presents no adverse effect on the equipment itself. CO2 typically comes in 2 kg and 5 kg sizes with either a fixed swivel horn for the 2 kg or omnidirectional hose and horn for the 5 kg version. You have explored carbon dioxide extinguishers. Now, Let's examine the means of deployment of carbon dioxide extinguishers. The jet of gas should be directed at the base of the flames and moved from side to side to cover the whole of the burning area. Since the gas does not provide any cooling effect, 
If the cloud of gas is broken, perhaps by wind action or gravity, the heat present will reignite the fire in the renewed presence of oxygen. Since carbon dioxide acts by displacing oxygen, it poses a serious hazard to people in the area, particularly if used in an unventilated or confined space. After the fire has been extinguished, the user must leave the area, closing any door and not re-enter until it is safe to do so, preferably after the area has been well ventilated. In addition to the asphyxiation hazard, there is another potential hazard that will affect the user, that of extreme cold. The expanding gas leaving the cylinder will cause the nozzle or horn and possibly the bottom of the cylinder to become extremely cold, sufficiently so to cause freeze burns if there is any skin contact. Thus, care should be taken to direct the horn before release of the gas and not to touch it afterwards. Some of these types of extinguishers have special handles on the nozzle or horn to facilitate their use. You have been introduced to carbon dioxide extinguishers. Now, let's look at the dry powder extinguishers. Powder extinguishers are available with various dry chemical agents that are able to either fight fires of classes A, B, C, classes B and C, or class D alone. They come in cartridge-operated or stored pressure types and in a variety of different sizes. Dry powder can be used intermittently and simultaneously with water in either a straight stream or spray configuration. You have explored dry powder extinguishers. Now, let's examine the means of deployment of dry powder extinguishers. The jet should be aimed at the base of the fire nearest the user and a blanket formed using a side-to-side -side sweeping action moving away from the user until all the fire is covered. It is important not to disturb the blanket formed or reignition could occur. In use, copious clouds of thick dust are produced, which can choke and disorient the user. In addition, the powder dust can cover wide area affecting equipment and furnishings for a wide area. You have explored the significance of communication and information control in handling an emergency. It's time to take a safe shot. Drag the correct option and drop it into the blank to complete the statement. Well done. Dry powder here are the key concepts that have been covered. Identifying hazards A hazard is something with the potential to cause harm. Hazard identification plan 